Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to a poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of ruthlessness was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich flood filled marrow, food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. reading from Philippians. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, Help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So today we are given an invitation to joy. Let's just make sure we don't miss that. In today's gospel, according to Matthew, this parable found also in the gospel of Luke has some parts that are perhaps difficult to understand, but the heart and the meaning of it come through clearly. The king gave a banquet and the invitations to the chosen guests were rejected. Actually, the words used by the writer are more troubling than outright rejection. The words are, but they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. Well, this was troubling 20 centuries ago when Jesus told this parable about an invitation to a joyous occasion that is rejected by the chosen and honored guests and then offered to those who are on the margins of society and it's still troubling and still true today. Because today, we still make light of the good news of God. I mean, you can look anywhere and realize it. It's not just that the gospel is ignored, it's ridiculed. People are, I think, frightened of religious expressions of faith and in their fear, they use ridicule, they make light of it. And even those who do believe can become so defensive in their reaction to societal indifference that they create their own idols in thinking that God and Christ needs their protection in order to survive. So we hear preposterous phrases in the media such as, we have thrown God out of the classroom or we have pushed God out of the children's lives by not having school prayer and so on. So we little human beings, no matter how hard we try, can ever push God out of our lives. Notice that the passage that you just heard Deacon Nancy read doesn't say that because the invited guests did not come to the banquet, that the wedding was canceled. No, the wedding and the feast were to go on as scheduled. Only the guest list changed. Whether we respond or not to the gracious invitation of God to partake in all of the wonders of God's banquet doesn't change at all the fact that the banquet will go on as planned. 
because it's not our banquet. It's God's. And God does not alter God's plans because of the indifference of human beings. God does not withdraw the feast. The choice to accept or reject the invitation to great joy by participating in God's banquet is left up to us. And the invitation stands. And why do we reject the invitation? Why would we? Well, gosh, we're busy people. We have work to do. We have families that need us, friends that are important, sports to watch, papers to read. We don't have time to worship God or to learn about our faith, you know, so that we even know what we really reject. We don't have time to serve others. We have serious work to do. We are consumed by commerce. Even now in the midst of a pandemic, most of our lives remain busy and cluttered, often too noisy to even hear the invitation to the banquet of joy. And when we are reminded of it, we're often embarrassed. We found other things to occupy our time and consume our energy, don't you know? When we are invited to take time to pray, to think, to learn God's truth, to share it with others, to focus on what is of eternal importance instead of on temporary needs, we make light of it. Oh, we intend to get to all that someday, but today, the cares of this world are more important than the cares of the kingdom. Well, Annie Dillard, one of my all-time favorite authors in her marvelous work, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, describes the early aftermath of the discovery of safe cataract surgery. Parenthetically, I would note that this theme was also picked up in the movie at first sight. Anyhow, in Dillard's book, she describes how the medical breakthrough of cataract surgery changed the lives of hundreds of men and women who had been blind from birth, but who after surgery could now see. Dillard points out, however, that this gaining of new sight did not come to many as pure joy. For those who had never seen before, seeing now became a demanding task. Even eyes free of cataracts, these people had to learn how to distinguish objects by sight, not by touch or sound. In fact, many, having had the operation, would go so far as to refuse to focus on any objects except those right in front of them. A boy would only look at something within 12 inches of his face. A young woman would shut her eyes and proceed about her house in the old accustomed way. So maybe the reason we stay stuck in intending rather than entering the kingdom, coming to the banquet, is that we like our blindness. We may actually prefer not seeing on our terms rather than seeing on God's terms. But it doesn't mean that we are irreligious, amoral, or godless people. More likely, we're simply busy people a people living by and with maybe what we could call societal cataracts. And we are in no great hurry to have them removed as we have too much at stake to want to see. How many of us are hesitating still because of the fear that attending the feast will make too many demands on our time, will limit our worldly possessions and our pleasures take from us some of our worldly possessions or pleasures or dilute our ambitions. You know, I have a secret fear about church going. I've been hearing this recently on the internet, and that is that it works sort of like a vaccine. A couple of drops under the tongue each week and pretty soon we are immune to the whole thing. 
Beseeching God for God's mercy and forgiveness takes no special effort. The summoning of the Holy Spirit expects no significant response, and even the sacrament, when it comes, may taste more like breakfast than the body of Christ sacrificed for us. In most churches, you know, it's possible to take part in all of this even while engaged in active enmity with the one who is pastoring you or other members of the community or the world at large. Perhaps we might want to put on our web pages these days as people are church shopping, the witty caution that you can become a Christian by going to church as easily as you can become a car by sleeping in a garage. There is more to accepting the invitation to the banquet than just showing up, even when we are all actually able to show up and go into our buildings. And I think we know that. And I think that's why we hesitate and stay intending in our response rather than full heartedly flinging our hearts open to joy, accepting the invitation to the banquet and offering everything that we have back to the one who makes the invitation to our salvation. Most of us, even as our buildings remain closed, are now entering into that time in the church here where we look directly at the dreaded word stewardship. And people immediately, you know, reach for their wallets to make sure that they're safe from those who might try and do some sort of ecclesiastical pickpocketing. And personal calendars amazingly get lost this time of the year so that people can get back to you when we start to talk about time and personal gifts and skills that might be offered back to God. In church circles, you know, the S word that makes people uncomfortable is not sex, it's stewardship. Leave my cataracts alone, we cry. We have too much at stake to want to see. And yet, and yet, God, our relentless, gracious God, who wants us so much to accept the invitation, continues to set the table and bake the bread. God tries to tempt us with succulent cooking odors, all the while inviting others, because no matter what, the banquet is going on. But God is still yearning for us to come and sit down too. Because God knows how barren our hearts are outside the banquet hall, how much we miss a peace and joy and healing and companionship when we pass up the invitation. Well, there's a story that I heard many summers ago now when I was at a preaching conference in Atlanta. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. It's a favorite story of uh, other clergy too. So maybe you've, you've heard it. It spoke to me then and continues to speak to me now of the fundamental and awesome pull of God to be close to him. So there was a little boy with Down syndrome living in Atlanta, he was about five years old and he was in church with his grandfather. His grandfather had placed him in the pew in front of him so that he could hold him and so that the little boy could also see what was going on. Every once in a while, the little boy would wiggle free and he would run up the aisle. And this didn't worry the grandfather too much because this had been his church for 40 years and he knew that people would watch out for the little boy. And sure enough, someone would catch him as he was running forward and take him back to his grandfather. One time, the little boy wiggled free, and before anyone could catch him, he ran up into the sanctuary just as the consecration had finished. Clearly, this kid knew where the action was. But the little boy gazed up at the man behind the altar, dressed in all the pretty clothes, and as he held up the bread and broke it, the little boy carefully put his hands out as he had seen other people do. Now this was a church 
and had a very defined program for First Communions. And this little boy had not been through any sort of training and had not made his first formal communion yet. All this ran through this loving pastor's mind as he looked down at this little fellow with the confidently outstretched hands. What kind of trouble would he get into with the members of his church? How many hours would he have to deal with this issue in the ensuing weeks if he gave in to this child's desire to be fed at the table of the Lord? In the seconds it took to think all that through, the church watched and held its breath. And then, making his decision, the pastor gently placed a host in the little guy's hands. Within a moment, the little boy ate the bread, the body of Christ, given also for him, turned around to the congregation and beckoned them forward, saying, y'all come. And with tears in his eyes, the grandfather came to also receive the body of Christ and to retrieve his grandson. God wants us to be close. God wants there to be nothing to get in between God and us. God does not want us to put anything there, not for ourselves or for others. It's easy to do it. We need to be constantly aware, aware of our tendency to get in God's way, aware of our tendencies to reject God's invitation to great joy because we are afraid of what it might ask of us. T.S. Eliot, the gifted Anglican poet, understood this basic human tendency to stay clear of God's desire for us and its requirements, juxtaposed with our deep need for God. He captured it prayerfully in the closing lines to his well-known poem, Ash Wednesday. Eliot writes, Blessed sister, holy mother, spirit of the fountain, spirit of the garden, suffer us not to mock ourselves with falsehood. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still, even among these rocks, our peace in his will. And even among these rocks, sister, mother, spirit of the river, spirit of the sea, suffer to be separated and let my cry come unto thee. Y'all come. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down in heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge how baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, in this challenging and uncertain time,
time to come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church, and the world. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serve as a beacon of hope to a suffering world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For, for Steve, Steve, our bishop, our for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that sustained by the Holy Spirit, they may faithfully serve you and the people given to their care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation and its leaders, grant our elected officials and civil servants the will to act swiftly and decisively with justice, wisdom, and compassion. Lord, in mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are ill, may they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to health care workers and all essential workers and all who are caring for loved ones. Bless all scientists and researchers around the world as they seek a treatment and cure for COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our for all those who seek justice and those who are charged to maintain order, turn our hearts toward you and towards each other. Show us the way to a just and equitable peace in our society. Lord, in your mercy, Hear for those who mourn, for those who suffer want and anxiety from lack of work and from the many strains and losses of this time, call us to support one another in love, sharing resources as we are able. Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low that we may find comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. O God, who made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus your Son, look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which affects our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now in the words that our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Go into the world of peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. 
Render unto no one evil for evil. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.